The following St. Louis Cardinals presentation is proudly brought to you by Budweiser, King of Beers, KPLR-TV, and KMOX Radio. of the King of Beers, Budweiser. Who's brought you thrills for a century? Glory days, Red Hot Plays, Hall of Famers, MVPs. They've got a rich tradition of Redbird history. 100 years, millions of cheers, the Cardinals on 11. Hornsby, Gibby, Brock, and Deer Stand the man right out the wheel And loving is the place where they turn on the heat We got the hits, you got a front row seat 100 years, millions of cheers The Cardinals on the heaven What makes KMOX the voice of St. Louis? As the number one station in St. Louis for over 20 years, and typically the station with the highest audience share in the country's top 50 markets, KMOX is really four stations in one. News, information, sports, and entertainment. KMOX has a strong reputation for quality on-air talent throughout the day and night. And no one knows more about innovative programming than KMOX. From pioneering talk radio in 1960 with At Your Service to the 1989 introduction of live broadcast exchanges with Moscow Radio, the tradition of leadership and quality continues today. years, the St. Louis Cardinals have produced one of the game's most treasured histories. They have captured 15 National League pennants and nine world championships. To the plate, a swing and a miss, and that's a winner! That's a winner! A World Series winner for the Cardinals! They fielded one of the most colorful teams of all time. I am possibly the only manager that carried an orchestra. We traveled with more instruments than we did shirts or anything else. They have produced 14 most valuable players and 20 batting champions. They pioneered baseball into a new era with the creation of the farm system. For more than half this century, they carved out Major League Baseball's only link to the Midwest. In a winning tradition unrivaled in the National League, they have brought St. Louis baseball a century of success, 100 years of Cardinals glory. The city of St. Louis was founded in 1764 and became the gateway to the West. Still the pride of America's heartland, St. Louis is celebrating 100 years of Cardinals baseball, a legacy of success that dates back to 1892 when the team joined the National League. But at first, under eccentric owner Chris Von Der Rye, success eluded the Cardinals. And when they were sold in 1898, new owners Frank Robison and his brother Stanley hoped to erase the last traces of the team's unfortunate past. Now Robison's coming in here 
were so annoyed with the failure of the ball club that they took all that brown uniform stuff off and put red on. And a woman fan watching the game one day, overheard by a reporter named Willie McHale of the St. Louis Republic, which is long gone, he heard her say, what a lovely shade of cardinal. Now see, she meant color. And it stayed color in people's minds. He, he picked it up and so they started calling them the Cardinals, or easy for headlines, cards. In 1911, the team passed on to Frank Robinson's daughter, Helene Britton, giving baseball its first female owner. But just before World War I, with the Cardinals on shaky financial footing, Britton sold the team to a local group. And in an auspicious move, the new owners hired Branch Rickey to run the team. Ricky's resume as ball player, scholar, and vice president of the American League Browns made him a unanimous choice. And soon, an enduring front office partnership was formed when Sam Braden became president. In 1920, Braden sold rundown Robison Field and used the money to launch Ricky's brainchild, a farm system. Ricky bought about 18 shares of the Houston Texas League franchise and bought the entire Fort Smith, Arkansas Western Association team, and that was a nucleus. Just as Ricky later came up with the idea, the concept of the black player as virgin territory, the farm system was his virgin territory. Rogers Hornsby, meanwhile, was giving the Cardinals what they would soon produce on their own, a superstar. He won six straight batting titles and hit 424 in 1924 highest average this century. Hornsby was a picture athlete, and he acted like one, never smoking, drinking, or even reading fine print or attending a movie, for fear that it would hurt his batting eye. He receives the Most Valuable Player Award for 1925. A cash prize is presented as part of the award by League President John Heidler and Commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis. Not every Cardinal was glad to be Hornsby's teammate. Specs to Porcer. I had the bad luck to be on the same team as two of the greatest second basemen in the history of baseball, Rogers Hornsby and Frankie Frisch. All Hornsby did was lead the league in hitting year after year. He hit over 400 in 1922, 24, and 25. I'm competing for the second base job with a man who is considered the greatest right-handed hitter of all time. Hornsby was player manager in 1926 when he helped bring about a move that would change the team's destiny. The Cubs asked waivers on Grover Cleveland Alexander, who was alcoholic, epileptic, but one of the greatest pitchers who ever lived. And Hornsby, though he hit Alexander well himself, knew that few others did. And he told Braden, he said, claim him, Mr. Braden. He said, I want him. I don't care whether he drinks or not. So they got him. What they got was a 39-year-old crusty veteran who would become the third winningest pitcher of all time. The Cardinals thought Alexander still had greatness in him, but not until October would they realize how much. Alexander is remembered by Butch Yotkeman, clubhouse attendant for more than five decades and the only Cardinal to witness all nine world championships. I was sitting on a bench and I was whistling that popular song, It Ain't Gonna Rain No More No More at that time. And Alex came around, he told me in sort of a little, it wasn't too bad in a gruff manner to quit whistling. Well, I didn't know that you wouldn't whistle on the bench or something like that or sing, you know, well, they just don't sing or whistle on the bench. So after he told me that, by a couple of players just told me, hey, Butch, don't don't pay attention to him. He said, your whistling's probably giving him a headache. He probably had a rough night or something. With Alexander, the 26 Cardinals fielded four other Hall of Famers. Sonny Jim Bottomley, who led the league with 120 RBIs. Hornsby, who was coming off two straight 400-plus seasons and with a bad back, hit 317. Chick Hafey, who some said was the second best right-handed hitter of his day behind Hornsby. 
and knuckleballer Jesse Haynes, who had been purchased seven years earlier. By now, with the farm system paying off, Haynes would be the last player the Cardinals bought for more than a quarter of a century. The Cardinals went into September fighting for a pennant, but due to a scheduling oddity, had to play the entire month on the road. Undaunted, they held on and with a couple of days to go, won the first pennant in the team's history. And then met the Yankees in the World Series. Against the likes of Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, no one gave the cards much of a chance. But after losing the opener, Hornsby's Cardinals came back the next day and came home tied at one win apiece. With its team home for the first time in more than a month, St. Louis pulled out all the stops in a celebration rivaled only by Armistice Day. But in St. Louis, the Yankees won two out of three, including a record-setting three home run performance by Babe Ruth in game four. Then St. Louis pitching turned the tide. Back in New York, Grover Cleveland Alexander won his second complete game and set the stage for one of the most dramatic moments in series history. It all came down to game seven. The cards led by a run in the last of the seventh when the Yankees loaded the bases with two outs. With Tony Lazari up, Hornsby pulled the starter, Jesse Haynes. Haynes uh, will be relieved, and I can't tell who's going to come in. Let's see who it's going to be. It is going to be Grover Cleveland Alexander. Oh, Pete will come on. The veteran Alexander will try to put out the fire here in the last half of the seventh inning. He'll first be faced by Tony Lazari. Again, the runners take their long two-out bases loaded leads. The pitch is we're going to miss for strike three. And that is all for the New York Yankees in the last half of the seventh inning as all Pete comes in in a situation that will go down as one of the most dramatic moments in all sports and strikes out, push him up, Lazari, with the bases full. Alexander's final reward came in the bottom of the ninth. In what has been called the only mistake he ever made on a baseball diamond, Babe Ruth tried to steal second with two outs. Bob O'Farrell's throw to Hornsby nailed the Yankee legend, and the 26 Cardinals gained immortality by beating one of the great Yankee teams of all time. And for the first time ever, the Cardinals were world champions. Well, of course, my greatest sports drill was the easiest thing that I ever did in a baseball game. Just catching uh, the throw from Bob O'Farrell and the final, make, uh, taking the throw from O'Farrell, making the final out of the 1926 World Series, tagging Ruth out as he slid into second base to make us the world's champions way back in 1926. Two months after the series ended, Hornsby's longtime disagreements with owner Sam Braden resulted in a sensational trade of the Giants for Frankie Frisch, a trade that at first infuriated Cardinal fans. Ironically, St. Louis opened the next season against the Giants, and while Hornsby, a Giant, received his series ring and watched the Cardinals raise the championship flag he helped them win, his spirit was with St. Louis. In 1928, the Cardinals returned to the top of the National League, clinching the pennant the day before the season ended. But they lost the World Series in four straight to the Yankees and would have to settle for their second pennant of the decade. Leo DeRocher. Now, I don't say we were the best club in 1934, but we thought we were the best. We were 25 that went together. That's the kind of a club we had. The Cardinals opened the 1930s by winning two straight pennants and both times took on Connie Mack's Philadelphia A's in the World Series. The 1930 Cardinals were worthy contenders with every regular batting above 300, but they ended up losing to the A's in six games. However, in their rematch of 1931, 
the Cardinals came away the victors and brought the World Championship to St. Louis. But no team of the 30s won the hearts of Cardinal fans more than the Gas House Gang, a collection of rambunctious characters who came together under player manager Frankie Frisch. By 1934, Frisch was every bit a Cardinal, and he managed the Gas House Gang with the same intensity he brought to his play. With Frisch leading the gang, they became one of the most colorful teams of all time, perfectly suited to the likes of Captain Leo DeRocher. So the dirtiest uniform, so oh, Frisch wouldn't let any, nobody change uniform. We had the dirtiest, filthiest uniform you've ever looked at. It was some kind of crew, and don't think that we fought with the other clubs any more than we did with ourselves. We fought more with ourselves in the clubhouse. But God forbid that anyone on the other club said anything about any one of our players. Then he had to fight the whole club. No member of the Gas House gang was feistier than second baseman Pepper Martin. We were in St. Louis on this Sunday. It was a game of the century and all that sort of stuff. It turned out to be quite a fight. Well, somebody lowered the boom on me and I got cracked in the eye. I tell you, I got the biggest back eye you ever seen. And Pepper come in and said, who cracked you, kid? And I said, I don't know, some guy took a pot shot at me. So he got mad and he went, went over to the giant dugout and challenged the whole giant dugout. He said, anybody hit that kid, the, the coward, he'll come out here and fight me, so I'm gonna take one or all of you. As it turned out, Pepper Martin took the whole National League by storm. Here I am again, folks. Martin had come up during the 31 season. He was a rookie at 27 and a hero in the World Series, batting 500 and getting a record 12 hits. A selfless player, he was said to chase every ball and dive into every base as if it were the seventh game of the World Series. I've been just a very ordinary ball player all my life. Pepper Martin was exactly what the country needed in 1931. He needed a hero. We were in depression, drought. It was an ugly time. Here's his hawk nose, wide-shouldered uh, Irish uh, Indian from, from Oklahoma called the Wild Hearts of the Osage. Now, those Cardinals cocky here today. Here's uh, Rip Collins, Pep Martin, Jack Ruthrock. And are they playing some frisky ball? Where Pepper led, the Gas House gang followed, and not just on the field. With him on harmonica, Martin's Mudcat Band exasperated Frankie Frisch with its dubious attempts at cowboy tunes. We are mud cats, we're something wild cats, and our ears are made of leather, and they flop in windy weather. Casual hemlock, we're tough as a pine knot, we're from Oklahoma, can't you see? The Mud Cat Band uh, was formed when Frisch was a manager. And used to drive Frisch crazy. He didn't like it. I couldn't say much about their music. <laughs> it wasn't too good. Let's change the tune, fellas. Let's put some gas in the gas house game. Bueno? Yeah, yeah let's go out and play some baseball. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dizzy Dean was the most celebrated member of the gang. He was just as good as he said he was, and had no qualms about holding out for more money. No, I haven't signed my contract this year yet, and don't expect to unless the Cardinals pay me $50,000. I'm worth $400,000 for the ball club, I'm at least worth 50 to myself. For three years, old Diz dominated the National League, and his admirers came from all over. In fact, he even had a fan in baseball's most legendary figure, who might have been the only player more popular. Dizzy Dean, they tell me that you're dizzy, but if I could throw a ball like you, I'd like to be as dizzy as you are. <laughs> Thank this you. is for your All-American. Pleasure to pick you on the team. Thank you. 
Dizzy Dean went to the third grade in school, but he was absolutely the greatest right-hand pitcher I ever saw. He could have stand 60 feet, six inches, the distance from home plate to the mound, and throw a ball in a knot hole 99 times out of 100. In 1934, Paul Dean joined his famous brother on the Cardinals, and Dizzy responded with a boastful prediction. Well, Paul, we ought to win 45 ball games this year. I think we will, Diz. If you'll win 35, I'll take care of the rest. Nice going, boy. <laughs> As the elder brother, Dizzy was only too happy to show Paul the ropes. I've been married four years, and I want to give you a little advice on married life. Always wear the pants of the family, and don't go in there and sweep floors and wash the dishes like uh, they're going to ask you to. Beat up big balls, see, at all times. Is that so? You might be the boss on the mound, but I'm the boss at home. Here, go in there and sweep that kitchen. Oh, what am I supposed to do You're with that? You're supposed to sweep the kitchen with me. Let it run my arm. I won't. Amazingly, the deans exceeded the prediction. Pitching in his first major league season, Paul won 19 games. And with Dizzy at his peak, he won 30, a win total unequaled for 34 years. The Gas House Gang was in peak form. They caught the Giants on the final weekend of the season and went to the World Series. This time, against Mickey Cochran's Tigers. Frank, congratulations on the great fights you made in this uh, past season. Thanks, the Mickey. Luck, the same to you. Lots of luck to you. You're a great fellow and a great man. Lots of luck to you. Dizzy was so confident, he didn't need any luck. What are you going to do with those Tigers, Dizzy? Well, I hope that I can beat them today. I think it's a great honor for me to pitch the opening day of the World Series 1934. Dizzy said that he and Paul would win two games apiece, and they did. The story of the series was not their pitching, but Dizzy's base running. In game four, Dizzy, who was idle that day, volunteered to pinch run. He barreled into second base to break up a double play. The ball hit him in the head. He was okay and told about it as only Dizzy Dean could. They carried me to the hospital, you know, took x-rays in my head and kept me in the hospital overnight. And the big headlines come over the next morning. X-rays of Dean's head shows nothing. <laughs> The series hitting star was Ducky Medwick. The son of Hungarian immigrants, Medwick was a perennial 300 hitter who would win the Triple Crown in 1937, the last National Leaguer to do it. Against Detroit in the 34 series, Medwick had 10 hits in the first six games. Joe, uh, you're within two of the World Series record. Do you think you'll break it today as far as hits are concerned? Well, Pep, I'll be trying my best. I, I only hope I can live up to that record that you did. To, rather, the series that you had, and I'm sure I will break it. a boy. But Menwick got only one more hit. In game seven, with the cards winning a blowout, he belted a triple and slid hard into third baseman Marv Owen. Tiger fans didn't appreciate Medwick's slide, and when he went out to take his position in left field, he was pelted with bottles, food, and garbage. For his own protection, Medwick was ordered by Commissioner Landis to leave the field. Some of them thought that Joe got a bad deal by getting put out of the game, but Landis told him he was getting put out for his own safety, which made sense. But we often wondered what the judge would have done if the game was was two to one or three to two or very close. Fortunately, we were winning by a big score. Dizzy Dean recovered from his head injury to beat the Tigers easily in game seven. The final was 11 to nothing as the Cardinals won their second world championship of the decade. The one and only for the famed Gas House Gang. Marty Marion. If you lose all the time, you don't seem to have much tradition. But the Cardinals was a team that won a lot. And when you put the, the birds on, we always used to call them the birds that go across your chest, sitting on the bat. Once you put that uniform on, you feel like you have the winning way. In 
In 1940, the Cardinals were looking to recapture their old magic. They brought manager Billy Southworth up from the minors and got a dazzling season from the big cat Johnny Mize, who banged out 43 homers, a Cardinal record that still stands. Though Mize would soon be gone, the Cards were building a winner thanks to a flourishing farm system. In 1940, Marty Marion was promoted and settled in as the leading shortstop of the era. Team captain Terry Moore and fellow outfielder Ina Slaughter were already established stars. The nucleus was complete when third baseman Whitey Kurowski and a pitcher turned outfielder by the name of Stan Musial arrived at the end of the 41 season. I always say Stan Musial hit 1,200 that year because he played at Springfield and he hit about 400. He come to Rochester, he hit over 400. And that year in St. Louis, he hit over 400. So that wasn't a bad, uh, bad start for a major league career. During batting practice, Stan hit one ripping shot after another off the wall and right or over the fence. And Hal Schumacher, the great giant pitcher, turned to Carl Hubble, the great giant pitcher, and said, you see what we're going to be up against next year, all year? In 1942, Musial, the rookie, hit 315, and St. Louis was headed to the first of three straight pennants. To many, it was the best Cardinal team ever assembled. Catcher Walker Cooper had a standout season. So did his brother Mort, whose best act was on the mound, where he won 22 games, had 10 shutouts, and was the league's MVP. But even with all their talent, the 42 Cardinals had to go on a scorching drive in September to overtake the Brooklyn Dodgers for the National League pennant. We had something that uh, a lot of ball clubs don't have. We had, a, we had the Cardinal spirit. We had togetherness. We loved to play. We loved, we loved uh, one another. We did everything together. And we just played together. I mean, we were a close-knitted team. We had pride in everything we did, you know. We didn't, we just uh, thought that we couldn't get beat. And that's the way I think that's what happened, you know, after we won the pennant and then went into the World Series. The Cardinals kept their momentum going into the series. Though they were young, they were undaunted by their opponents, Joe McCarthy's Yankees, who had won six pennants in seven years. The series opened in St. Louis, and though the Cardinals were no hit for seven innings in game one, they did manage to come back with a spirited rally. It left them short, but it gave them confidence. We came back in the ninth inning, and we thought, well, if we come back in the ninth inning, we can come back the whole series. St. Louis did come back and win game two, and went to New York refusing to be intimidated. We get on a train, we're going to New York, and all of us are in one of these compartments. We're talking, you know. And and uh, we'd made a statement, and a writer happened to hear it, says, well, we're, we're not going back to St. Louis. We're going to win it. And so uh, this writer, when we got off the uh, train, there was a big headline, the cocky Cardinal says they're not going back to St. Louis. Amazingly, in New York, the Cardinals beat the Yankees twice, in one game achieving the rare feat of shutting them out. And then in the ninth inning of game five, they found a hero in Whitey Karowski. When I picked that bat out of the bat rack, I got three swings, and I'm going to take them. And if you recall in the first game, he struck me out four times, but he, I swung. I didn't, I didn't take no pictures. I kept swinging. And he just got one. Instead of getting it inside a little bit to me, he got it out over the plate a little bit, and I was fortunate enough to hit it. That's by roughing. Here's the pitch. Karowski swings and drives one. Deep left field. Going, 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 going. It is gone. In there for a home run for Whitey Karowski. What? I remember about that ball game more so than that was the ninth inning, the bottom of the ninth, when the Yankees had two men on base, first and second, and Walker Cooper picked off uh, Joe Gordon off second base, and that kind of broke their backs and uh, helped us win the ball game. Behind rookie Johnny Beasley, the Cardinals beat the Yankees and brought the world championship to St. Louis. Karowski was the toast of the series, but as it turned out, the team's euphoria didn't last, for the Cardinals were about to undergo a big change. It was a happy moment and a sad one for me, because I knew I was leaving for service, 
So I couldn't celebrate in uh, nothing else because I knew I was going to service already. Like all major league teams, the Cardinals began to feel the impact of World War II. In 1943, in addition to slaughter, five players signed up for the service. Stan Musial, however, was still playing and in 43 had his first great season. He hit 357 and won the MVP as the Cardinals won their second straight pennant. But in a series rematch against the Yankees, they lost. The next year, in 1944, the Cardinal roster was decimated even further. But they chalked up 100 wins for the third straight year and ran away with the pennant. Marty Marion played brilliantly at short and became the third straight Cardinal player to capture the MVP award. For the first and only time in baseball history, the World Series never left St. Louis as the Cardinals played the Browns at their shared home Sportsman's Park. The Browns won their pennant on the last day of the season, the only one in the club's 52 years. And sentiment in St. Louis seemed to favor the underdogs. Well, I think they were all pulling for the Browns. I really do. And uh, surprisingly, the Browns had a doggone good ball club. Matter of fact, they almost beat us. The Browns won two of the first three games. But after that, the Cardinals got great pitching from Harry Burkeen and Mort Cooper. They knocked off the Browns in six games, and for the fifth time in their history, and the second time in three years, they were world champions. But this victory celebration turned out to be a farewell party, as the Cardinals were about to lose their young hitting star, Stan Musial, to a year of wartime service. By now, the roster was so depleted, the club took out an ad in the Sporting News in the hopes of finding qualified ballplayers. In 1946, prosperity returned when Cardinal stars came back from the war. Eddie Dyer, a one-time pitcher, was now managing a Cardinal team that included rookie second baseman Red Shandings and returning outfield stars Eno Slaughter and Stan Musial. Musial and Slaughter got right back in the swing. Musial won the batting crown and the MVP, and Slaughter was hitting and hustling as ever. Some said that Enos never walked to his position or to the bench or anywhere else on a baseball field. Enos Slaughter uh, was a tough uh, competitor, you know. Enos, uh, he, he came to play. When he put the uniform on, you know, he was uh, at the beach and he hustled and uh, set a good example because uh, he loved to play baseball and he was tough, rough, and uh, he was a great competitor. In 1946, Slaughter led the league with 130 RBIs, and the Cardinals, made up almost entirely of players who came through the farm system, got into a scorching pennant race. They rallied around great talent and a good luck song that kept them loose. Pass the biscuits, Mirandy. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Pass the biscuits, Mirandy. I'm just as hungry as them. Pass the gravy, Mirandy. Give me some sop to sop them in. Every time we'd win a ball game in St. Louis, the doc had that record on. And he had all of his medicine bottles, and he'd take the scissors, and he'd play while the record was playing. He, he could play those medicine bottles. Shooting gives a man an appetite. Oh, pass the biscuits, Mirandy. Pass them and kiss me goodbye. And we always played it. When you win, we never played it when we lost, so no music when you lose. The Cardinals beat the Dodgers in baseball's first ever playoff and met the Red Sox in the World Series. Here in home movies taken by Sox second baseman Bobby Doerr or Boston's World Series opponents, Eddie Dyer. Ina Slaughter. Marty Marion and rookie catcher Joe Garagiola, who recalls the series. It tickled us how we were such big underdogs against the famous Red Sox, because they had Williams and DiMaggio and York and Pesky and Bobby Doerr and all those big hitters, and 
And we were the underdogs, but we went in and, and led by Terry, uh, we felt like, uh, hey, uh, they're not gonna run us out of the ballpark. We're gonna be all right. With a series tied at a win apiece, the two teams moved to Fenway Park for game three. Boston's great hitter, Ted Williams, had batted 342 that season, and the Cardinals came up with a plan to contain his bat. Teddy Dyer said about putting, putting a shift on, he said, well, move Marty over to second base side and move me to shortstop. Well, I said, instead of moving Marty out of his position, just move me out of my position and put me over to second base side. The shift worked. Williams tried to bunt to get on base, but he managed only five hits in the series, all singles. As for the Cardinals, they evened things up with a blowout in game four, getting four hits apiece from Garagiola, Karowski, and Slaughter. In all, the team had a record tying 20 hits. In game five, the series turned on Enos Slaughter. Not only did the Cards lose the game, they were about to lose their hustling outfielder when he took a pitch on the elbow from Joe Dobson. I fell back and hit me on my right elbow. And I played for a couple innings, and I got to where I had to bat. I couldn't swing the bat, and I couldn't throw. And I, that's the first time in my career that I went to Eddie Dyer and said, Skipper, I can't help our club. And I'll never forget it. That was our last game. We were heading back to St. Louis. So I got on the train, and Dr. Weaver, our trainer, they had an electric sleeve, and he wrapped my arm in an Epsom salt towel. And that's where I stayed all the way back to St. Louis. When I got to St. Louis, Dr. Howell took me right off the train and went to St. Mary's Hospital. From there, he x-rayed my arm. And he says, uh, you know, I'm sorry that you can't play anymore. He says, you've got a, such a bad hemorrhage. He says, if you get hit on it again, I'll have to amputate your arm. I said, Doc, that's the chance we take. I'm going to play this ball game. Back in St. Louis, Slaughter did play game six. And he contributed a hit to Harry Brackeen's second victory. But all six games would be merely prelude to an unforgettable Game 7. With the score tied at three in the bottom of the eighth, Cardinal fans were about to witness one of the most daring plays in series history. Slaughter led off with a single. And when he reached first, he thought back to a play that happened a few days before. In the earlier game, Mike Gonzalez had stopped me at third on a bad relay throw and we lost the ball game. So Eddie Dyer says, uh, from now on with two men out and you think you've got a chance to score, you go ahead and gamble and I'll be responsible for it. The next two batters made outs, leaving Slaughter stranded at first. But the player who hustled his way to the Hall of Fame couldn't wait. With Harry Walker up, Slaughter took off for second. Walker hit one into left center. The throw from the Boston shortstop, Johnny Pesky, was too late. And Slaughter raced all the way home with a go-ahead run. When I hit second base, I says, I can score. And I never looked up. All I was thinking about when I rounded third was Roy Partee, the catcher, trying to block home plate. I saw him pull up in front of the plate, and I hit the dirt. Slaughter's mad dash promptly took its place in World Series legend. And the Cardinals, backed by Harry Bikin's three victories, had their third world championship in five years. The team was in full and glorious bloom. Slaughter was the series hero that year, but for more than two decades, the Cardinals had a hero year in and year out in Stan Musial. When you're doing something that you love to do, why, and it, being successful at it, why, uh, made it a lot easier. <laughs> if you, you know, when I knew I was going to hit 300 every year, that made it a lot easier. Stan Musial came from Donora, Pennsylvania, but he belonged to St. Louis. In time, he would pile up dozens of National League records. And in 17 seasons, Musio would bat higher than 300. He won seven batting titles and three MVPs. Frustrated Dodger pitcher Preacher Rowe claimed he knew how to get Musio out. I throw him four wide ones, 
and then I'd try to pick him off first base. Even in the All-Star game, pitchers moaned, here comes the man again. Sullivan's first pitch to stand, it's pointing out as a drive back into right field, a long run, the ball game is over. This 12th inning homer won the 55 All-Star game and marked Musial's greatest All-Star moment. Even in a game that had no bearing on the pennant race, Musial hated to make an out, for at all times he was a study in concentration. If he got a hit his first time up, he had to get a hit his second time up. And if he got two hits the third time, he just, you knew he was going to get a hit. And if he got three hits, he hardly talked to anybody because he wanted that fourth hit. And if he got the fourth hit, he'd be just like a tiger pacing almost, waiting to get up there for that fifth time. I was able to uh, become a good hitter because early in my career, I learned how to hit the ball to the opposite field. I could take a pitch and, uh, and hold back. And my, I, my body might be moving forward, but I always had my hands back and I didn't commit myself at all. This statue at Bush Stadium stands as a reminder of Branch Rickey's words. You can make a study of Musial's life and learn how to be a decent human being. Never changed his demeanor, whether he got one hit or four hits, or when he got the five home runs here in St. Louis and in a doubleheader against the Giants, he was the same fella. He'd come in the clubhouse during doubleheaders, drink a glass of milk, and then maybe a, a bowl of soup. He's made a point of trying to get back to baseball something. Uh, you can pick up the phone and say, Stan, I have a crippled kid here. Uh, you're his idol. Uh, he'd give anything to see you. Stan would pay his own expenses, fly in with a, with a flock of uh, pictures and mementos and so forth. Ford Frick summed up Musial. Here stands baseball's perfect warrior. Here stands baseball's perfect knight. As far as I was concerned, I was most happiest when I put on the uniform, and played baseball. Musial's longtime roommate, Red Shandings, gave the Cardinals another Hall of Famer. An outstanding switch hitter, Shandings won the 1950 All-Star Game with a 14th inning home run. Three years later, he was the star on a less than stellar team, batting a career-high 342, the first Cardinal in 12 years to out-hit Musial. That year, 1953, a new Cardinal tradition was born when Fred Size sold the team to the Anheuser-Busch Brewery. Now congratulations are in order for you, Colonel Bush, for the fine thing that you have done in, in uh, buying the St. Louis Cardinals. Well, thank you very much. We're delighted to be the owners of the Cardinals, and we're going to try to give the fans everywhere the finest baseball that is known in the United States. Well, I'm sure that uh, you will fully live up to the old Cardinal tradition. Bush also bought Sportsman's Park from the Cardinals' landlord, Bill Veck, whose Browns left for Baltimore, and after a $2 million renovation, renamed it Bush Stadium. By then, St. Louis Cardinals baseball was an institution spread across the Midwest. Its games were heard from town to town and from state to state over the airways of KMOX Radio. Well, I think that's probably as great a part of Cardinal history, the broadcast, going back to Harry Carey and even before him, Franz Locks. That's as big a part of Cardinal history as anything. People who are not familiar with Cardinal baseball don't know when we're talking about Cardinal baseball, we're talking about Missouri, Indiana, Illinois. Tennessee, Kentucky. North Carolina. Louisiana. The Midwest and the South and as far as our signals would carry, we're all Cardinal fans. And we did have a far-flung network of uh, around 125 stations. So I know a lot of people probably were, uh, were uh, raised on, on Harry Carey's style of baseball broadcasting. I remember a cork ball game that Louis Trumper and I used to play all the time, and it, it wasn't who won the game, but it was who imitated Harry Carey the best. Uh, and, and they were the winners in the game, and I'll never forget those days. In bringing baseball into every town from Raleigh to Dallas, Camo X has forged a bond with the Midwest that has made the Cardinals the real America's team. 
The Cardinals' other institution, Stan Musial, marked his 1958 season with a milestone hit in Wrigley Field. Here's the pitch. Right there, there it is! Into left field! Hit number 3,000! A run is scored! Musial ran first! On his way to second with a double! Holy cow! Stan, I wonder, do you have any other goals set for yourself? Well, of course, this was a big one. Of course, I, uh, I just uh, want to keep playing now, and uh, I don't have uh, too many other goals. Uh, uh, although I would like to finish the, my National League career as, uh, as uh, one player who uh, had more hits than anybody else in the National League, so it's going to take another couple years. Musial reached his goal and was the all-time National League hit leader when he brought his long, brilliant career to an end on the last day of the 1963 season. Naturally, I hate to say goodbye. So until we meet again, I want to thank you very much. Musio marked his farewell with one last hit, number 3,630. A hot shot on the ground in the right field, a base hit. Here's the around third. Here's a no throw. The Cardinals lead one to nothing. Listen to the crowd. Now listen, Gary Cobb is going to replace Musio. There he goes. After 22 seasons, all with the Cardinals, Stan Musio was through. Tim McCarver. If the Gas House Gang was knocked down, knock them, rock them, sock them, and professionalism was in the 40s, well, the teams of the 60s were a combination of the two. Always with the Cardinals, we were always contenders, every year. With Johnny Keene at the helm in the early 60s, the Cardinals headed into a decade of prosperity. They were built around a nucleus of third baseman, Kenny Boyer. Center fielder, Kurt Flood. First baseman, Bill White. Catcher, Tim McCarver. And the greatest Cardinal pitcher of all time, Bob Gibson. Everything started to come together in 1964. That June, they traded pitcher Ernie Brolio to the Cubs for a little-known outfielder by the name of Lou Brock. It was the deal of the century, though at the time, St. Louis didn't know what to expect. The dominant thing about Lou Brock to me was that he was a low ball hitter with power. Uh, I can remember several shots back in the 63 where he hammered that ball down and in. So I thought of him, ironically, uh, more as a power hitter. I got to St. Louis and uh, St. Louis had just lost to the Dodgers two years in a row as they saw it, and they, they lost simply because the Dodger had a stolen base artist by the name of Mario Wills. I got to St. Louis, and the manager called a meeting and said, we're going to have a base stealer, and we're going to match the Dodgers base stealer for base stealer. And I go, wow, we're going to do all that? What happened with Brock is that he gave us something we didn't have. We didn't have a leadoff man, and we didn't have speed. He gave us all of that. And consequently, when that happens, it, li it lifts everyone up. Gives everybody a little enthusiasm. Brock went on to bat 348 and became part of a Cardinal lineup full of stars. Bill White batted 303 and had 100 RBIs for the third straight time. The MVP went to Ken Boyer on the strength of 24 homers, 100 runs scored, and a league best 119 RBIs. Still in all, the Cardinals were 11 games out of first as late as August 24th. But in a famous collapse with 12 games to play, Gene Mock's Phillies lost 10 in a row, fell out of first, and allowed the streaking Reds and Cardinals to jump into the fray. I would like for it to be more of a, a fairy tale and say that we didn't give up and all that, but uh, you know, the Phillies were primarily responsible for the fact that we didn't give up. 
Gene Mock, the manager of the Philadelphia Phillies, kept pitching two pitchers down the stretch, Chris Short and Jim Bunning. And when you pitch a pitcher every two days, 200 hitters become 400 hitters. You are actually allowing the other team to get off the deck. In late September, Cardinal Penn and Holmes soared when St. Louis swept three games from the visiting Phillies. And as the cards moved into first, no fan was more ecstatic than the team owner. Here it is. A bouncing ball. They should do it. The Cardinals are in first place. The Redbirds win it eight to five. Gordon Richardson being congratulated. And now the pressure has been put on by the Cardinals. The cards led by a half game when the Mets came in for the final weekend of the season. There were four teams when we started the games on Friday with only three left to play, that could have been a four-way tie. That's never, ever been done before. Down to the final day. In Cincinnati, the Phillies, now eliminated, beat the Reds. 300 miles away, it was all up to the Cardinals. Johnny Keene about to bring the Redbirds their first pennant since 1946. And the Cardinals, one oh, no strike! Come on! If you've never heard Mr. Gussie Bush excited, you just heard him over my shoulder. Let's go! Get him out! A high pop ball! The Cardinals there! The Cardinals won the pennant! The Cardinals won the pennant! The Cardinals won the pennant! Everybody out! Everybody congratulating everybody! St. Louis had its 10th pennant and first in 18 years. We took advantage of everything with three clubs being in first place uh, within the last 10 days, you know what kind of a race uh, it has been, and uh, it's been a hectic thing, but it's all worth it. The Cardinals went into the World Series facing Mickey Mantle's Yankees, who'd won 14 pennants in 16 years. By game four, the Cards trailed two games to one when they found a hero in Ken Boyer. With one hit in the first three games, Boyer came up in the fifth inning, and with one swing, wiped out a 3-0 Yankee lead. There's a driveway back. It might be. It could be. It is a home run. Kenny Boyer, long time two in this World Series, just became the ninth player to hit a grand slammer. Boyer's blast even the series and helped swing the momentum the Cardinals' way. The next day in New York, Bob Gibson and Tim McCarver turned in their heroics. Gibson struck out 13 and held the Yankees to two runs in 10 innings. And in the 10th, McCarver delivered the winning blow, a three-run homer. A Yankee win the next day brought the series to a final game seven. Mel Stottlemyre faced Bob Gibson, both pitchers going on two days rest. Gibson was helped by an aggressive offense that pulled off a double steal while scoring three times in the fourth and three times in the fifth. The Cards built a 6-0 lead and a tired but determined Gibson held on for his second complete game. And when Dal Maxville squeezed the last out, the Cardinals had their seventh world championship and they did it by coming all the way back from 11 games out in late August. As it turned out, this would be the Cardinals' last celebration here. Two years later, another Cardinal era passed. Double play ball to short. Davenport to second. One. Over to first. Two. The game is over. And the last game has been played at Bush Stadium. That May, home plate was taken from the old ballpark to the new Bush Stadium. Cardinal fans received a certificate on opening night, and as the final touches were added, the Cardinals hoped to find as much success in the new ballpark as they had in the old. By now, the Cards played under Red Shandings, the Hall of Fame second baseman, who had been one of the most well-liked players in Cardinal history, and the choice to hire him was a popular one. Red was a great guy to play for. He was an easy-going fella. He just let you play. If you had the ability, and the desire and the work habits, Red put you in the lineup, and, you know, he was very successful with it. 
In his first couple of seasons, Shane Deans didn't have much success. And though the Cards had talent, they finished no higher than sixth. We could put a lot of hits on the board, but we weren't scoring big runs. We didn't have big hitters in the middle of our lineup. Uh, we practically became the laughing stock of baseball in 1966. We actually started jailing at the end of 66, and we knew somebody was going to pay the price in 67. That year, Orlando Cepeda had an MVP season, batting 325 with a league leading 111 RBIs, all of which seemed to come with two outs. It was Cepeda's first full season with the Cardinals, and with their Puerto Rican star leading them all away, the Albertos wouldn't think of leaving home without him. We got on the bus and uh, Charlie, we nicknamed him Charlie or Cha Cha or whatever. Charlie was late for the bus and uh, Gibson was pitching that night. And, uh, and Red kind of looked back the bus and naturally saying, all right, is everybody, uh, is everybody on? We're ready to go. And Gibson said, no, Cepeda's not on the bus and we're not leaving until he gets on the bus. That was the feeling I think that everybody had about Cepeda. In July, with the Cardinals in a pennant race against their rival Cubs, Bob Gibson broke his leg when he was struck by a line drive off the bat of Roberto Clemente. But despite losing their best pitcher down the stretch, the Cards refused to collapse and soon broke away from the Cubs. And when they clinched the pennant, the winning pitcher was none other than Gibson, back after six weeks. We had a team. They played as a team, and uh, they were a bunch of nice guys, good guys. On it. They played hard. They were, they were rough, and they were tough. We had a great ball club. There's no question about it. And uh, they knew how to play, and I'd let them play. In the World Series, the Cardinals took on the Boston Red Sox, who had miraculously won the pennant. Lou Brock was a one-man wrecking crew. In what turned out to be a hotly contested seven-game series, Brock batted 4-14, and set a record with seven stolen bases. While Brock led the offense, Bob Gibson, as usual, led the pitching, showing no ill effects from his broken leg he beat the Red Sox in games one and four, both times going all the way. Boston's ace, Jim Lonborg, was equally tough. He shut out the Cardinals on one hit and then beat him on three hits. The series came down to a final game seven. Chandings gave the ball to Gibson on three days rest, while Lonborg was back on the mound after two days rest. And thanks to the Boston media, the Cardinals had plenty of incentive. I think what really happened, what really helped our ball club was when we got up and read the Boston Globe and it had headlines of those big three or four inch block letters. It said, Longborg and Champagne. And when we read those headlines, I think it really hurt them. Uh, I said to myself, and I think our ball club said, there's no way. Gibson made sure of that. In the fifth inning, he contributed to the Cardinals' offensive attack by banging out a home run. On all counts, Gibson just plain overmatched the Red Sox. He pitched a three-hitter, struck out ten, and won his fifth consecutive series game. Best of all, the Cardinals were world champions, putting an end to any ideas about Lonborg and Champagne. It infuriated us. We were mad and we went out to prove that article wrong and when it was all over we couldn't wait to get in the clubhouse and say Lonborg and Champagne, huh? The city of St. Louis turned out to welcome home the world champions and salute their star pitcher who won three games in the series. Congratulations and welcome back to St. Louis. Thank you. It's good to be back. You're pretty tired? Yes, I'm pretty tired, among other things. What other things? Other things, um, <laughs> kind of under the weather. You're feeling uh, happy, though, even though you're not feeling so well? Right. Uh, there's, there's no greater feeling than uh, the feeling that I have today. The next year, 1968, 
Bob Gibson took the Cardinals to their third pennant of the decade. In a season in which he was never batted out of a game by the opposition, Gibson won the MVP and the Cy Young Award, producing one of the greatest performances in baseball history. The thing I remember most about the 68 season is I, I didn't do anything wrong too often. Uh, and, and that's unusual. When you, you go out there with the confidence that you can do anything you want to do, and I did. Anytime I went out on the hill, it was Sandy Koufax, it was Juan Marshall, it was Ferguson Jenkins, just about the best pitcher on the other staff. Uh, I never did look at it as though I was pitching against Sandy Koufax because I couldn't figure that he'd hit me anyway. I was more concerned about the hitters than I was the guy that I was pitching against. And back in those days, that's the way it was. You pitch nine innings, and, and what really made you angry if you had a reputation of being a guy that couldn't finish a ball game. Bob Gibson was the toughest athlete I have ever seen. The night before he pitched, you'd call his hotel room, he was there, in the room. Next day at the ballpark, don't talk to him, even if you're a member of his team. We had a comfortable lead. It was like six or seven to nothing in the, in the seventh inning. And the leadoff batter had opened the inning with a triple. And uh, naturally, a catcher's responsibility to grab the pitcher, tell him what to do. And I went out and I said, Bob, ball to you first base. He said, nope, nope, I'm coming to you. Just be ready. I said, but he said, don't worry about it. He said, that guy's not going to score. Well, I don't know that it's unreachable. Uh, if, if it is unreachable, the only reason is because you won't find anybody pitching 300 innings anymore. Uh, I think there are plenty of guys that are capable of having that type of earned run average, but I don't know if it's over a span of 300 innings. When I look back on 68, it, it seems as, uh, as though I'm looking back at somebody else's uh, career, not my own, because it was something that, that only happens once in a lifetime. The season culminated in one of the most anticipated pitching matchups in series history. Cardinal fans lined up to see Detroit's 31-game winner, Denny McLean, face Gibson in the series opener at Bush Stadium. In footage not seen since the day it was broadcast on October 2nd, 1968, Gibson not only outpitched McLean in game one, he made World Series history. Two strikes and a ball. The pitch to K-Line. Got him! Listen to the crowd. He has just tied a World Series record. Here's Norm Cash now. setting a new World Series record. It's fantastic. The fans just stood and cheered you. That must be your most thrilling moment in sports. You've had many. Well, I, I guess so. I didn't know what they were cheering about, and uh, Tim came out in front of the plate, and I just turned around and looked at the scoreboard. I, uh, I had no idea. Going into the World Series, the report on me, Bob Gibson, fastball pitcher, 95, 96, and what they didn't write was that my best pitch was my slider. And the reason I struck out so many guys is because they were looking for the fastball and I was throwing sliders. But it was not a big deal. Winning the game and winning the World Series, uh, that was important. But after the Cardinals took a three games to one lead, they found out they were not invincible. Though they dominated the National League all season, they ran into unexpected problems against the Tigers. They gallantly took Detroit to seven games, but could not overcome Mickey Lulich. The Cardinals would not be back to the World Series for 14 years. Batting third and playing third base from the St. Louis Cardinals, Joe Torre. In the Cardinals' long list of great achievements, 
Joe Torre's 1971 season stands high among them. That year, he drove in 137 runs and batted 363. I remember uh, so many things about 1971, like June. I remember sitting next to a sports writer, Jack Herman, on a plane. I said, I'm going to leave the league in hitting. And I said, the only thing that could hurt me at this point in time is if I, you know, if I get injured. And I was uh, sort of kidding about holding on, getting in and out of the shower because I didn't want to slip on a bar of soap. Despite Torrey's MVP season, the Cardinals could do no better than second place. And though they had respectable seasons in the 70s, they would not win a pennant in the decade. Still, there were standout players, like catcher Ted Simmons, who batted 300 or better six times with the Cardinals and hit 20 or more homers five times. Al Roboski brought the bullpen a new look and a new demeanor. As the mad Hungarian, he was utterly intimidating, and not just for his fastball. Gary Templeton gave St. Louis a great hitting shortstop, whose best season came in 1979, when he became the first switch hitter to get 100 hits from each side of the plate. In the middle of the decade, St. Louis said goodbye to the greatest pitcher in Cardinal history. Bob Gibson was leaving with 251 wins, 56 shutouts, a no-hitter, and 3,117 strikeouts, the milestone number 3,000 coming one year earlier. But the numbers told only one part of Gibson's story. Your examples of good sportsmanship and fair play will always be in an inspiration to us. Good luck to you from all of us. While one Cardinal great was leaving, another was in his heyday. Lou Brock was in the midst of a career that would make him the most prolific National League base stealer of all time. Twelve years in a row, Brock stole 50 or more bases, and in 1974, at age 35, he shattered Maury Will's all-time single-season record of 104 steals. He is going! The pitch is a strike! The throw! He is there! He did it! 105 for Lubra! The most important thing was to avoid long slumps and uh, try to stay sharp. And that wasn't an easy job. When you get to be 35, it's, <laughs> it's extremely tough. <laughs> In each of the next two seasons, Brock collected 56 steals, and in 1979, ran past his only other obstacle, Ty Cobb's all-time record of 892 steals. He's going! The pitch is high! The throw is safe! He stole it! The throw got by the shortstop, and Brock has done it! And this is it, folks. Brock has now stolen 893. I was told this is how you steal a base. You get a lead, get a good lead, and you take off. And uh, I got a lead, I got a good lead, and I got picked off. And, and people laugh at you a few times. And when you get laughed at, uh, you really want to turn the tide or do the big payback. So you go out and learn how to do all these things. And once you become good at it, you look at the finer points of it, uh, and then you begin to compare uh, the techniques and develop the technique that's necessary to do those things so you can do have the big payback. And so it was fun after that, the big payback. You remember you laughed at me last year? Take this, take that. While Brock was stealing his way through a record-setting career, he was also batting his way to eight 300 seasons and more than 3,000 hits. The milestone hit coming in 1979. Breaking ball, get off the pitcher, to the third baseman, no play, base hit. Brock would retire before the end of the decade, and when he did, he closed out a glorious chapter in Cardinal history. Tommy Herr. We were able to stand up against anybody, against teams that most so-called experts considered better than us and, and come out on top. And I think that's a tribute to the type of individuals that were on the teams. I think it's a tribute to 
the Cardinal tradition, and I think it's a tribute to Whitey as the manager. In 1980, Whitey Herzog took charge of the Cardinals and began to shape one of the most exciting teams of the decade. I was given an opportunity in St. Louis that no one's had since Connie Mack. I mean, uh, I only had to answer to Gussie Bush. Uh, I didn't have to uh, have a meeting with anybody. I could go to bed and have a meeting. I was a manager and general manager, and uh, I could sleep on it and go down the next morning and make a deal. I didn't have to ask anybody. The only thing that Gussie Bush wanted me to do was tell him before he got the newspapers. So I think that was the reason that I was able to put the ball club together as I liked it and uh, to get the people I wanted. And if a ball player didn't do it the way I wanted to do it, I'd just trade him. Herzog's biggest trade came after the 81 season when he swapped Gary Templeton for Ozzie Smith, who would lead a completely revamped Cardinal team that played baseball Whitey's way with speed and defense. talent in the world, but we had heart, and we had guys that wanted to play, and we were aggressive, but we created. Instead of giving, we took. You know, you take, you go after it, and we won a lot of games by being aggressive. Lavelle at the belt. Checks. Brummer stealing off. He is safe, and the Cardinals win. The Cardinals leading by the score of 4-2. They are one out away from being the division champs for 1982. The pitch, a ground ball to third. Albert Fowl has it, throws, that's it! The Cardinals have won it! The 82 Cardinals won the division, swept Atlanta in the playoffs, and went to their first World Series in 14 years. The Cardinals and the Milwaukee Brewers split the first two games in St. Louis. And when the series moved to Milwaukee for game three, Willie McGee took over. Alone into right field. Way back goes Moore. Way back. Way back. Willie McGee has just hit a three-run homer and put the Cardinals on top. Now he swings and hits it down the line and right. That's going to go. He made Willie McGee. Willie McGee with the bat and with the glove has been a one man show tonight. That was one game where I just felt everything came together. You know, I did everything that I could possibly do except for still a base. You know, I threw the ball well a couple of occasions. I played defense well and I hit well. The timing, the situation dictated the importance of it to me and to my team. So, I mean, that was the best I can be. Behind McGee's exploits, the Cardinals stuck to their October tradition and battled their opponents to a seven-game series. In the finale, St. Louis was trailing 3-1 in the sixth when the red-hot Keith Hernandez came up with the bases loaded. They're roaring here. Here's the pitch. Swing and a line drive into right center. That ball is a hit. That ball is ahead and the score is tied. We have a 3-3 game on a hit by Hernandez. George Hendrick came up next and drove in what proved to be the winning run. And in the ninth inning, it was all up to the National League's best reliever, Bruce Suter. Suter from the belt to the plate. A swing and a miss, and that's a winner! That's a winner! A World Series winner for the Cardinals! 
It was fun. I'll tell you, it was the most fun I've had playing baseball in my whole career. No question about it. It's a great feeling. Gussie, uh, to you, Whitey, to you, Daryl, to you and all your teammates, Joe, to you as general manager, the trophy that says you're champions of the world and you deserve it. Uh, thank you, boy. Thank, thank you very you. much, my friend. That's marvelous. Cardinal fans couldn't agree more as they poured onto the streets of St. Louis to celebrate their team's ninth world championship. But with no penance in the next couple of years, it was individual achievements that were celebrated. Bob Forge had his in 1983. He's set into the windup. Here's the 1-1. One -one. Swing and a ground ball. The third baseman Robert Phil has it. The throw. Forge has pitched a no-hitter. It's the first time in the history of Cardinal baseball that a pitcher has two no-hitters. And listen to this crowd. By 1985, the Cardinals were back in championship form. They defied the preseason forecasters and ran roughshod over the National League, stealing a club record 314 bases. Vince Coleman set a rookie record with 110 steals. Willie McGee won the MVP and chalked up the highest average ever for a National League switch hitter 353. And having the year of his life, Tommy Herr drove in 110 runs. Our thing was just to create havoc, basically, uh, with good overall team speed and making things happen. Because we didn't have those big power guys, so you had to kind of create things. And we were able to do that once we were able to get on the bases. St. Louis held a three-game lead over the Mets when the two teams squared off with less than a week to play. The Cardinals lost the first two and then regained their momentum in the finale, all but knocking the Mets out of the race. And a swing and a fly ball to short right field. And Strike is there and that's a winner! A winner! The Cardinals are two games out in front with three to play. Two days later, John Tudor capped off his stunning turnaround with win number 21. Swing and a line drive into right, may fall, Van Slyke, that's a winner! And the Cardinals have won 101, and they've won the Eastern Division and headed into the playoff against the Los Angeles Dodgers. It was now a best of seven series, and the Dodgers took a two games to one lead. To make matters worse, just before game four, the automatic tart machine rolled over Vince Coleman's leg, sidelining him for the rest of the postseason. The Cardinals evened things up in game four, and in the next game got a small miracle from the Wizard. With a score tied in the bottom of the ninth, Tommy Lasorda and his ace reliever Tom Deedenpure were about to get the jolt of their lifetime from the light-hitting Ozzie Smith. Smith, Corks went into right, down the line, it may go! Go crazy, folks, go crazy! It's a home run, and the Cardinals have won the game by the score of three to two, and a home run by the Wizard! Ozzie's first ever left-handed home run brought St. Louis within one game of the pennant, but back in LA and trailing by a run in game six, the Cardinals were down to their last out. That's when Jack Clark stepped to the plate with two on, and Needenfuhr again on the mound. Swinging it a long one into left field. Adios, goodbye, and maybe that's a winner. A three-run homer by Clark, and the Cardinals lead by the score of 7-5, to five, and they may go to the World Series on that one, folks. The Jack Clark home run, I think, it was just a tremendous home run to put us into the World Series and to see the excitement that brought to the city of St. Louis. I think that that moment will go down as uh, a historic one in Cardinal history because so many people reacted in the same way when he hit that home run. It was just an incredible feat. And so the Cardinals won their 14th pennant and headed to their second World Series in four years. The series was an all-Missouri affair between St. Louis and Kansas City. Behind great pitching by John Tudor, 
the Cardinals took a commanding three games to one lead. But after losing game five, the series moved to Kansas City for a controversial game six. St. Louis broke up a scoreless tie in the eighth and was still up one nothing in the last of the ninth when Todd Worrell's pitch to Jorge Orta marked the beginning of the end. Orta was ruled safe on the play, even though television replays showed he was out. After that, the Cardinals unraveled, and the World Championship went to the Royals. If there was one constant throughout the 80s, it was peerless shortstop Ozzie Smith. It's funny because uh, no one ever really said to me, you know, you go play shortstop. It's like one of those things that's always been there. When I became a junior in high school, I think is really when baseball became serious for me and I realized that I had a unique talent. Guys that are good at what they do, there are certain things that must be done that they do naturally that allow them to excel. When I'm on the baseball field, I'm able to create as I feel. It's sort of like having an artist sit down and take his brush to canvas. That's what hopefully comes across when I do what I do out there on the field. I hope that people see me doing things as I feel free to do them with no restrictions. Playing shortstop, making his eighth consecutive all-star start from the St. Louis Cardinals, Ozzie Smith. Here she is, swing, a one-hop shot, diving play by Ozzie. Long throw, you wouldn't believe it. Thanks for swings and a great stop by Ozzie Smith. He'll throw to third. They got Wilson. I feel that it was a God-given talent that I've kind of worked at, at maintaining as much as I possibly can. I was blessed with a great hand and eye coordination, and, and all I've tried to do is hang on to that as long as I possibly could and share it with as many people as I could, and that's what this is all about. It's about entertaining. I try and be as entertaining as I possibly can. Uh, I hope that when people come to the ballpark to see me or whoever, um, you know, hopefully when they leave the ballpark, they don't feel that they, they were cheated. They feel that they got their money's worth, and that's what I'm there to give them. He is the greatest. He is the greatest defensive shortstop to ever play the game. You can't say that about very many players at very many positions. In 1987, Ozzie made a name for himself at the plate when he batted 303 and helped lead yet another championship season. Jack Clark carried the offense with 35 homers and 106 RBIs and spearheaded the Cardinals' drive to a surprising first place. But a ten-and-a-half game lead shrunk to one-and-a-half when they played the Mets in a critical September series. The lead was about to shrink even more. But in the ninth inning of Game 1, St. Louis rallied. With one on and two outs and the Cardinals down by two, Harry Pendleton Cut loose. Pendleton hits the long one into center field. Get out of here. Wilson going here. back. Get it is out of here. And it's tied up at 4-4. Four, four. Terry Pendleton. Pendleton's home run was the turning point as the Cardinals hung on to first place. And then at home in front of their club record setting fans clinched the division title. An exciting moment at Bush Stadium, the pitch. Swing, a half swing. The ball back to Cox. Out at first, that's the winner. The Cardinals have won the Eastern Division crown again. We knew that we were a quality team. We wanted to bounce back from 86. A lot of things went sour in 86, and uh, we had to listen to all the Mets stuff about how they were going to be a dynasty and, and win year in and year out. So I think 87, we we came in on a mission again and, and wanted to get back what we thought we deserved and what really pulled us through in 87 was a very strong bench. The bench was a big factor for us that year and, and I think really uh, put us over the top. In the playoffs, the Cardinals took the Giants to seven games and it was the bench that proved heroic when Jose Oquendo did what the Giants never expected. Shane Lowe. 
it. The lead grew to six to nothing, which was plenty more than starter Danny Cox needed to wrap up the Cardinals' 15th pennant. High fly ball to shallow left. Vince Coleman, Minnesota bound. And World Series bound for the third time in the decade. Unfortunately for the Cardinals, four of the seven World Series games were played in Minnesota's Metrodome. There the Cardinals lost the first two games. But back home, things were dramatically different. Another hero came off the bench and delivered an improbable blast. First and third, nobody out the pitch. Swing and a high fly ball to left. Way back at the track. It's a three-run home run for Tom Lawless. That is hard to imagine. He had four hits all year. Lawless Homer sparked a three-game sweep at home. But back in Minnesota for Game 7, the Cardinals couldn't overcome the Metrodome or the Twins. To be involved in three World Series in a, in a six-year span was, uh, you know, something not too many people uh, or teams get to do. So we, we should feel very fortunate in that. As it turned out, this would be the last World Series for August A. Bush, Jr., whose death in 1989 at the age of 90 marked the end of a cardinal era and the loss of a phenomenally successful businessman and an irrepressible showman. St. Louis has entered the 1990s with Joe Torre as manager. As a hard-nosed ex-cardinal player, Torrey is upholding a style of baseball built on aggressiveness, talent, and good old-fashioned hardball. No other National League team has had a richer or more successful tradition, a tradition that has stood proudly for 100 continuous years. You felt, as a Cardinal, that there was a Cardinal way of playing. It was almost like, hey, until the last out is made, you got a chance. And the fact is that when you said St. Louis Cardinal, people knew that when you played, you played. You put on a Cardinal uniform, you feel different. You feel like you want to fall in the dirt and roll over <laughs> just to get your uniform dirty. The team, the field, the park, the city, the fans. And I remember George Hendricks telling me that enjoy it while you're here because it won't get any better. Well, I think what really the Cardinals have stood for for years and years is this good, clean, wholesome entertainment. You know, the American dream, the Red Shandings, the kid from Germantown, Illinois, or the Mike Shannon who was born in South St. Louis, can make it to the big leagues and play for the Cardinals. We still have that good, clean, wholesome attitude about the organization, the city, the Midwest, the whole region. The Cardinals had a uh, announcer by the name of Dizzy Dean. This is a great Cardinal, one of the great Cardinal uh, pitchers of all time. And every day, Dizzy Dean would uh, sing the Wabash Cannonball. So I, I kind of learned that song, the Wabash Cannonball. So, so uh, Dizzy would would sing this song, the Wabash Cannonball.
fresh, pure, and natural. The only beer with the genuine taste of the king of beers, Budweiser. Budweiser.